Dr. Hansen, welcome to The Elephant. Uh, glad to be here. Can you tell me what you're doing in Paris? How is your conference going so far? Yeah, well, I, I hope to make clear that what the politicians seem to be talking about is really inadequate. It's very analogous to the Kyoto Protocol. The politicians from all over the world? Yeah, basically from all over the world. You know, in science, when you do a clear experiment and get a result, you expect that if you do the same experiment again, you're going to get the same result. But what these politicians are talking about is basically the Kyoto approach, you know, cap and trade. You know, what's the cap on India? (laughs) You know, we know that as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, then countries are going to keep burning them. And, of course, they're not really cheapest because they don't include their cost to society. So it's really a a very simple problem. Make the prices honest because, actually, economies are more efficient if the prices are honest. So you you mean we need a, a strong carbon tax? We need a carbon fee. I would call it a carbon fee in those countries where they collect the fee from fossil fuel companies and distribute the money to the public so that it's not going to the government. Then it's really appropriate to call it a fee. And it's one which, first of all, makes the economies more efficient, so it actually spurs economic development and creates uh, jobs and moves you from dirty fossil fuel energy toward clean energy. You provide incentives both for the business community because they will, if they understand that the carbon fee or carbon tax is going to continue to rise, then they will make the right investments and move toward clean energy. And people will have the incentive to pay attention to their carbon footprint. So how much of a fee would you say we need for the adequate amount of economic stimulus or economic transformation to happen? Would it be like $100 a ton or what would that look like? Well, you know, it's quite uh, remarkable that a relatively modest fee begins to have an effect promptly. The main thing is that both the public and the business community needs to know that it's going to keep rising because then they will make decisions that are different than they would. You know, it's like people who buy automobiles. If they see the price of gasoline fluctuating, then they think, well, next year it's probably going to be back lower anyway. So they have to know that it's going to keep going up. And then you'll start getting the right investments and alter the uh, choices of the consumer. But to give you a specific number, we have looked at $100 a ton over 10 years, you know, $10 a ton going up $10 a ton each year. That reduces emissions in the United States by 30% in just 10 years. So that's pretty high in some sense, although it's low in comparison to taxes in some European countries on petrol. But it's enough to have a huge impact. And without that, We know that global emissions are not going to go down rapidly. They'll probably continue to go up at a moderate rate, just as they have in the past, because although some countries will reduce their emissions 10%, 20%, maybe 30%, but then the developing countries, they will increase and, and the total global amount will stay high. And that's a disaster for young people. That's become very clear. We can't pretend that we don't understand that. Our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations, but we can only pretend that we don't know. You know, the leaders have got to come to grips with the fact that we do need a fundamental change in direction, and it's not going to be reached by just asking each country do better. That's basically what they're doing. They're asking each country to come in with a promise for how well they'll try to do. With their voluntary pledges or? With their voluntary cuts. Although You don't think that's not enough? That You don't think that's a good approach? It's certainly not enough because some countries are even saying right out, you know, India says we're not cutting at all. We're, we have to increase our emissions because we have a lot of people in poverty and they, they want to raise them out of poverty. They have every right to do that. But we need to do it in a way that allows <laughs> Indians and everybody else to have a planet on which... Um, you know, future generations can continue to thrive. If we let uh, ice sheets go unstable and sea level go up several meters, that's 
virtually doomsday in the sense that there are so many cities on coastlines, the economic consequences would be incalculable. And the number of uh, climate refugees that you would have be in the hundreds of millions. It seems kind of crazy when you put in those terms that uh, often the, the dialogue, the discourse is around can we afford to act on climate? Can we afford to stop burning fossil fuels? Yeah, and that the, the crazy thing is that actually the economies are stronger if you do it in the right way. Uh, that means a gradually increasing carbon fee. And it shouldn't be a tax, because if it's a tax where the government takes the money and decides what it's going to do with it, that depresses the economy. Taxes depress the economy. But if it's a fee where the money goes to the public, it's actually a progressive tax in a sense. People who fly around the world or have two houses, they'll be paying more than they get in the dividend if you divided the money equally to all legal residents of a country. So you think it should be revenue neutral, any carbon fee or carbon tax? Yeah, it should be revenue neutral. And furthermore, I think the way to make it neutral is to give an equal amount to all legal residents. That way, the low income person is going to benefit. And the person who tries hard to pay attention to their carbon footprint will benefit and it will spur the economy because the, the, the lower income people spend the money when they get it. So it actually stimulates the economy and economic studies have been done uh, to show that. Can you comment on the Obama's recent rejection of the Keystone Pipeline? I mean, you helped bring this to the public's attention through pointing it out and uh, saying this could be a, a real problem. If the tar sands completely developed, then it, you know, it's kind of game over for the planet. So could you comment on the significance of the Keystone being shelved? Well, stopping the Keystone Pipeline will be useful if we get a carbon fee that rises over time, because then those uh, tar sands will be left in the ground permanently. If we don't get a carbon fee, they will eventually come out of the ground because we're still addicted to fossil fuels. We have to solve that addiction, and you don't solve it by instantly going cold turkey. <laughs> You've got to uh, gradually have a rising price on carbon emissions, and then we can move in an economically sensible way to a clean energy future. But politically, does it represent much that uh, Obama was willing to do that after the activism over the past several years by yourself and groups like 350.org? Well, it does indicate that the environment movement does have some political clout, but it's not enough for politicians to say we're doing something, because that's what they said in 1997 with the Kyoto Protocol, and they chose a policy which didn't work. In fact, emissions were going up 1.5% per year prior to the Kyoto Protocol, after that, they've gone up 2.5% per year. Now, what we have to have is emissions declining. That is a tough row to hoe, and that will require that we have this economic drive. Are you hoping that we've hit the peak this year, potentially? Well, we had better hit the peak this year within the next couple of years. Otherwise, it becomes practically undoable. Because we, you know, in the legal cases that we filed against the federal government in the United States, we show that if you wanted to stabilize climate by 2100, you would need to reduce emissions several percent per year. But if we allow them to increase a few more years, then you have to decrease them 10 percent a year. That becomes implausible. So it's really important that things start soon. That's why I ha we have to draw attention to what seems to be a plan for the political leaders to clap each other on the back and say, oh, now we've agreed to do better. <laughs> they actually have to have a plan that would work. I'm wondering what it's like for you to have been working on this for so long, famously testifying in front of Congress in 1988. And I mean, here we are coming up on 30 years later, and we procrastinated. We haven't done much. And still there's the entire Republican field of presidential candidates saying, you know, either global warming is, doesn't exist or it's not a problem. It must have been very frustrating for you this whole time to see this slow-moving disaster and us not taking the action required. Can you just talk about what it's been like personally as a scientist in this area? Well, of course, it's very frustrating because we know that the actions that we need to take make sense. You know, we should at least have been developing technologies 
but you don't really get the development until you get the economic drive for it, and that's why the price on carbon is so important. We are going to have some climate impacts which are now unavoidable, but the really disastrous ones, I think, can still be avoided. You know, the things that I'm most concerned about are those things that are irreversible on any time scale that we would care about, and that includes sea level rise of, of many meters and extermination of a large fraction of the species on the planet. Those are ends that we will guarantee if we stay on business as usual for decades more. And we can still avoid that, but we have to start moving uh, quickly. Recently, we just passed, for perhaps the last time, the 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Can you talk about the significance of that? Well, we realized several years ago, published a paper in 2008 with some of the best relevant scientists in the world, carbon cycle experts and paleoclimate experts, climate modeling experts, and we concluded that if you wanted to stabilize climate, you would need to actually reduce the amount of CO2 from its present amount to about 350 parts per million and we're now just past 400. Well, we can still get back to 350 by the end of this century if we reduce emissions several percent a year. It's uh, technically difficult but achievable. It would require that we move to carbon-free electricity. If we can do that, that's basically the solution because you can make liquid fuels from electricity if you have sufficient amount of uh, electrical energy. So that's what we have to develop, and then we can solve the problem. But right now, we're using coal for a lot of the electricity, especially in the developing world, because that's the cheapest energy for, for them to use. So how would we get back down to 350 if we've already gone to 400? What would that require? Well, the ocean and the biosphere are always taking up CO2. The in annual increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is only about half of what we are putting out by burning fossil fuels. The other half is going into the ocean and into the soil and biosphere. If we stop emitting CO2, you would still get CO2 going into the ocean and biosphere because it's out of equilibrium now. We've got this huge amount of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's trying to come to equilibrium with the conditions in the ocean and biosphere. So we could get back. So if we stopped emitting, it would start to slowly creep down eventually? Yes. If you stopped emitting, it would go down about 2 ppm per year for a while, and then that rate of decline would slow down. But we could get back to 350 ppm by the end of the century, but that would require reducing emissions quite rapidly, about 6% a year. And do you think that's possible? It's technically possible. It would require the strong drive from a, a rather strong rising carbon price. And if we come close but don't do it that well, we could still make up by finding ways to store more in the soil. There are various ideas, biochar and improved farming practices and reforestation. So there is a possibility of getting back there without being quite that stiff on the rate of emissions reduction. You published a paper a few months ago that looked at sea level rise. Can you talk about some of the risks and what your projections were looking at for what sea level rise could be by the end of the century? Yeah, well, what we conclude is that sea level rise this century is likely to be much larger than what IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been talking about. Their estimates are less than a meter. However, if you look at the Earth's history, when ice sheets have melted, sea level has gone up several meters in a century, and their models just don't yield that. The physics of ice sheet collapse is very complicated, and one of the best modeling groups recently wrote a paper in which they changed some parameters in their model, and instead with a two-degree ocean warming, Instead of getting a 2-meter sea level rise, they got a 17-meter sea level rise. So it just shows how uncertain the ice sheet modeling is. We're better off, I think, looking at the history of the Earth. And it tells us that ice sheets are quite sensitive, the time scale. Yeah, I think the problem was that 
scientists misinterpreted the observed response time of ice sheets, which was related to the time scale of the forcing of the ice sheets, which was on very long time scales. The Earth's orbit changes on 10,000 to 100,000 year time scales. But now humans are putting a forcing that's changing enormously in one century. And the lag time in ice sheet response to prior forcings is only of the order of a century or two. So it is a mistake to think that ice sheets are like rocks. They're not. They're much less uh, stable. When you start getting melting on the surface and a fracturing of the ice, it can collapse uh, quite rapidly. And so your research shows that it could be much higher than a meter by the end of the century in sea level rise? Well, yeah, we conclude that if we stay on the business as usual, that we will probably get sea level rise of several meters this century. We argue that it's a nonlinear process, and it's better characterized by a doubling time for the rate of mass loss rather than by a linear change. It's uncertain, but I would expect it to be several meters this century if we stay on business as usual. When you look at the leaders in the world, you know, 150 of them are here in Paris. Is there anyone that is taking the steps required or acting with the level of urgency that you think the climate crisis necessitates? Well, I shouldn't say for sure that no one is, because I haven't heard individual responses of leaders, but I'm surprised that it seems to be very similar to the Kyoto discussion, where they're just asking nations to take more ambitious targets, but they're not willing to say we need a price on carbon. And they will say, oh, well, the cap and trade represents a price of sorts. But who's going to do it? You know, you you have no way to make that global. There's no way to force other countries. So you think it's important for it to be global in, in scope? Yeah, it needs to be global or near global. And the only way for that to happen is for the major powers to agree to have it and then put border duties. That would be a huge incentive for the other countries so they could collect the money themselves rather than have the participating nations collect the money at the borders. Right, I see. So if the EU, the U.S., and China gets together and say we're going to institute a carbon fee and Australia refuses to, then anything that Australia exports would then be subject to import duties? Yes, and it would be a huge incentive because if you want your industry and citizens to have clean energy and be competitive with the other nations, you had better get on board. What do you think the most misunderstood thing about climate change is in the general public, if you had to identify one thing? Well, what's hard for the public to grasp is the fact that we're already at an emergency. We have a global crisis. And when the public looks out the window, they don't see that much going on. It doesn't seem that different. The reason that they don't is because of the inertia of the system. We've only felt about half of the response for the gases that are already up there. And we're continuing to add more gases uh, rapidly. So it's this delay time in the system, which, you know, people don't tend to act until they see it with their own eyes makes it very dangerous in this this case. Which is the thing that makes it a very dangerous uh, situation. Well, looking forward, I mean, I guess I would be curious about what gives you the most reason for hope and what things you're most worried about when it comes to this problem. Well, I think that more people are beginning to appreciate the situation. And as the climate change becomes more obvious, it should be easier to get action. Now, of course, there's resistance from, especially from the fossil fuel industry, and they have a pretty powerful message because they say, oh, we need this energy for the economy and create more jobs, and they can advertise so heavily that it's just like with an election. Someone who has a huge budget to advertise can win an election. You know, environmental groups have a negligible budget compared with the fossil fuel industry. They don't exactly have $800 million like the Koch brothers. (laughs) Right. Yeah, so, 
we just have to try to make this story clear and uh, hope that we can get some politicians who are willing to take the long view. We will see. Whatever comes out of this conference, it won't take many years to see whether we've turned a corner and started to reduce emissions rapidly. You know, we really have to draw attention so that we're looking at year by year what is the change and, and make sure that uh, we keep politicians' feet to the fire. So, and would you say that, you know, a strong social movement, that's what we need in order to be able to do that? Yeah, we need a strong social movement, but it also needs to be one that understands what is needed. What I'm encouraged by is the fact that in the United States, there's a group, Citizens Climate Lobby, and in fact, it's now in Canada and several European countries in which they are arguing for a simple revenue neutral rising carbon fee and they are lobbying with uh, legislators and they writing letters to the editor and their numbers are growing every year and I think that's the right approach try to use the democratic system but make sure that the solution is actually going to be one that's effective. And just one final point, I mean, I think kind of the elephant in the room at this climate conference is maybe the Republicans, even though they're not here, because it's influencing the whole way the approach to the treaty is happening, where it can't be binding because it would never get through the Senate. What are your thoughts on that? Because that seems to be a really central obstacle. Well, I've talked to a number of conservatives, and behind the scenes, the knowledgeable ones are beginning to realize that if they continue to deny the reality of the climate change, it will come back to bite them because Mother Nature is making it clear that this is not a hoax. And therefore, the solution they would like would be one that's consistent with conservative principles, and that would be let the market help you find the most efficient route to phase off of fossil fuels. There are a number of Republicans, including uh, perhaps most famously George Shultz, who has written several op-eds saying that we need a revenue-neutral rising carbon fee. And so you don't take the view of Naomi Klein, who says that we need strong public investment in things like transit and things like renewable energies in order to be able to do it? I don't think we have to destroy capitalism to solve this problem. If we do, we're sunk because we're not going to destroy capitalism quickly. You know, I've talked to uh, business leaders. Most of them have children, and if not grandchildren, and, and they would like to be part of the solution. But what they want from the government is guidance and policies that allow them to continue to make money. So they want to know if they, if they say they would like a rising carbon fee. As long as they know what it's going to be, they will make their investments accordingly. So I think, on the contrary, that the business community can be part of the solution. Dr. Hansen, thanks so much for joining me. Sure. Thank you.